Sure, uh, I'm Bill Molnar. I'm the city's uh, community development director. I started with the city in November of 1987. So I've been there, I guess do the math, maybe 31 plus years. I'm Derek Sieberson. I'm a senior planner with the City of Ashland Planning Department. Started on March 19th, 1996 <laughs> in the city recorder's office for a one week temp job that's extended for now 24 years. <laughs> so Bill, I'm interested in when you started with the city, were you um, still in college? Uh, no, uh, this was uh, really my first uh, position. I took, uh, my wife and I had moved to Oregon in, in 1985 um, to Eugene. I attended graduate school for the, uh, uh, the pre prestigious uh, college at I-5, Oregon State University, and she was going to the University of, of Oregon. And so um, after obtaining my master's, I applied for a entry-level planning job for the city of Ashland and uh, interviewed with the late John Friganesi and Dick Wanderscheid that still uh, works for uh, uh, Bonneville um, uh, up in Portland and uh, started in November 1987, moved down with uh, Lisa and uh, we've been here ever since. What was working with John Friganesi like? Well, you know, you know, John just was, uh, you know, a, a dynamo. You just enjoyed, enjoyed being around him. I, I remember uh, my first day coming to work, and um, you know, I think he was wearing, you know, flip flops. You know, very casual atmosphere, and um, you know, he just brought so much energy to the department. But it was a, it was a. A creativity uh, uh, that uh, was, uh, you know, you know, most enjoyable being around John. It wasn't a whole lot of, um, you know, uh, formalities. It was really the, the the art of planning. You know, what were the key issues in the community? Uh, what we needed to get out and and and, and tackle. He was very good in terms of uh, making people feel feel comfortable in in a public um, environment you know in, in times we're just we're I'd have to say they're just different back then everyone uh, was really excited about you know tackling big issues of, of growth and change and um, uh, individuals that were on different sides of an issue or even different sides politically I think saw a common um, uh, you know a camaraderie about um, uh, being in the same room together and, and, and um, uh, dealing with key, key issues and it was an important time that uh, when I got to Ashland in the late 80s uh, what you could see is that uh, you know, property values were just starting to starting to to to, to starting to go up, and uh, I believe Ashland's tremendous livability was catching on from people outside outside the area, and uh, we started um, seeing interest. Uh, especially from individuals in the Bay Area that were coming up and since Ashland had so much to offer in terms of uh, the arts, a university, a wonderful Main Street character, but still a five and a half dri hour drive from San Francisco or similar from Portland, we were just, uh, I think we were just poised to be uh, discovered and really that started driving a lot of the actions in the community because um, you started seeing change occur at a, at a different at a different level uh, construction homes were starting to get bigger uh, properties that you thought were probably very difficult to build on now were being developed because uh, 
individuals that um, had, for lack of a better term, wealth or whatever, uh, saw Ashland as a very livable, desirable community, and 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 you started seeing from the local community uh, uh, anxiety started to be uh, created because you did start seeing change. Um, modest style buildings that were historic, uh, more uh, interest in terms of removing those and replacing those with uh, larger buildings. Um, and then as you'd expect, um, housing costs started uh, going up. Uh, certain individuals on maybe that had lived in Ashland for a long time on, on fixed incomes saw their property values going up and in turn their property taxes and uh, and you know I met a number of individuals over the years just because as a, as a city planner you go out to locations before a development proposal comes you talk to people in the neighborhood and you know often they're very gracious they talk that change is inevitable but they um, would assume that they're uh, you know at some point they will likely you know, be priced out or need to move on to another community because uh, of their property um, uh, values going up and in turn their taxes. Uh, you know, it reminds me of a funny story because um, one individual that was a good friend of John Friganessi's, um, uh, Jeffrey um, Bernard, who uh, was a local sculptor that I believe restored the Parazzi Fountain and did some other um, works in Ashland. At the time produced a, a small, he was also a musician, so he sm produced a, a video called Equity Refugees and it, and it takes place with him I think with an electric guitar at um, on I-5 where you see the uh, sign Welcome to Oregon and it's a song that's essentially he's um, I, I guess making fun of or, or, but documenting the concern of uh, individuals coming from the Bay Area, buying property, raising the prices of homes, and then um, causing locals to um, move out, difficulty for more affordable housing. And so that's coined the term equity refugees. They, they could s sell their uh, properties for a tremendous amount of, of, of money in the Bay Area. They come over the border in Mercedes moving van. They got Dave shades on and keep got even tan. And they're looking for houses, maybe the place you live. They pay you good money, they got a friggin' time to give They sold off the shack and the bird For a profit of a thousand percent They took all the money and ran To buy a house to make it look like a tent They don't mean any harm, they don't want you to fear The middle class down there, the millionaires are here And that's why they call them Deputy Refugees They bought up the coastline and now the beach is two feet wide They bought up the mountains and took up all the sunny side And, and then the video closes with him yelling out, we're not for sale And so uh, it's, uh, I still have a, a copy of, of, of that video But uh, you know, again, it, I think it points to just some of the um, anxiety at the time And you see a, a movement of foot of more, um, I would get not to use a planning term, growth management that the community realizes there's something special about Ashland. There's a, a character, a livability, but these pressures of um, I think what we called sort of the uh, another quote we coined was that Ashland. Um, was a victim of its own success, that uh, the community that had put so much uh, or um, together to create a character now to some degree was a little under attack because uh, uh, there was a realization outside the city of that character and, and people wanted a little bit of that and uh, how do you 
acknowledge that uh, individuals have a right to purchase property, develop property, but how do we uh, manage that in a, such a way that it, uh, um, the elements that created the tremendous character we don't lose along the way? And what are the, some, of the, some of the ways over time that we've been able to, to manage that? Some projects that you've been involved with or ordinances? Uh, wow, there's so many, so many meetings, so many ordinances. Uh, well, I, you know, I'd say some of the key um, you know, projects that came along, uh, I would say, you know, first of one of the ones was the, the the Tolman Creek Shopping Center, where you have Albertsons and, and Rite Aid. You know, that was a pretty sleepy intersection as you came into town. I'm not sure if Tolman Creek, as you go north down East Main, was even paved back then. Uh, but uh, you know, you had a proposal for a, a large shopping center, and to many, that was sort of an example of the concern of uh, more of a, um, uh, a uh, uh, I'm not sure what the term would be, where you're going from more of a, a local community with smaller grocery stores scattered through the community to now a, a shopping center. Shopping centers is what really people experienced from where they used to live and not, and not in Ashland. And now you have a shopping center with uh, at least two buildings that were 40,000 square feet um, and at a scale that uh, no one was used to, no one felt comfortable with and you know you're looking to the planning department to do something or how can we how can we allow this to happen so uh, I, I remember uh, as we were trying to get a hold of the whole issue of bigger buildings where I, I think a big part of small town character and that's what really has always been a theme throughout Ashland for years is this small town character it often has uh, to do with uh, the great scenic qualities around the community, uh, the ability to engage people pretty informally but just a sort of scale of development in terms of buildings and so uh, the shopping center was 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 much larger than anyone that we had ever uh, that we had dealt with and I, I, I still remember myself and, and John Friganesi going to some of the smaller grocery stores like I think it was Ray's Century and Byright and talking to some of the owners talking about you know what was going on in the grocery store business that we needed all this new space and and I think it was at Safeway that the manager was saying well it's not that there's a lot of new products it's just that when we used to have I think Coca-Cola and RC Cola now we have Diet Coke, Cherry Coke, there's just a lot more variety which was creating a need for a tremendous more amount of shelf space and so uh, the grocery store that was originally 8,000 and then you went to Ray's Century that was like 18,000 now Albertsons and some of the bigger stores required 40,000. So what it led to is a movement afoot that um, what you'd hear of we need a big box ordinance we need to we were also at the time uh, there was interest in the uh, in citing a, a factory outlet store on the east side of town and so uh, there was a concern that we we needed some additional codes or standards to keep those buildings at bay and uh, you know, we set up. Uh, you know, Alberts. I mean, the shopping center was ultimately approved. A, a, um, a signal was put in, which is another, I think, element of the town changing and becoming not a small town but a small city. Each time you put in a traffic signal, because people aren't used to it. they're used to, you know, a stop sign or maybe a four, you know, four stop signs. But when you put a, another signal. Uh, you know that's a, a, a change in the landscape that uh, uh, people are just not used to but we put together a committee to address um, 
building sizes. It was called uh, uh, just a large-scale building committee. It had a lot of people in the community involved and ultimately after, uh, out of that committee Ashland I think was the first city in the state to uh, create a maximum building size and it was uh, we created a maximum building size of 45,000 square feet. Um, you know, uh, I'd like to say I could remember exactly how we stumbled upon 45,000. I think at the time we had just approved Albertsons and Rite Aid uh, at like 42,000 and every one said, you know, that's, <laughs> that's, that's well big enough. So let's, and that's, and that's where it starts. So that was one of the, you know, first, uh, I guess major uh, challenges or, or controversies. Uh, that we with, that we dealt with, and I could go on with a number of others at the time. <laughs> How about parking? Um, Ashland in our downtown hasn't required parking for twenty or thirty years for new development. Now it's coming around nationally that the Institute for Transportation Engineers is recommending that cities abandon minimum parking requirements and leave it to the market. Mm -hmm. um, we were a little ahead of that curve in the downtown and I'm just curious how that came about and uh, and how you've seen parking impact things over the years. Well, you know, oddly enough, when I got here, uh, believe it or not, that was already in place, that the, the city's downtown already had a, a, a standard that we would not require parking on private property and you know there's probably not a standard out there that has done more to really create the character you see in the downtown today. I think there was an acknowledgement that um, historic downtowns you you have a, a level of character that's created by creating building after building after building without large interruptions in your streetscape for parking areas and that parking in in well-designed downtowns is, is provided through on street or carefully locating those in public uh, parking areas and, and what I think it also recognized is that um, the downtown area, because um, it's one of the city's four uh, districts on the National Register, you know, you realized that most of those parcels had create, been created a long time ago. And if you required parking to be provided in conjunction with development, um, it would very it'd be very difficult to do so and so it allowed um, redevelopment of the downtown not only redevelopment but redevelopment in in a character that was uh, did not mimic you know ma main street but really was a um, you know reflected you know, new materials, new design, but was very careful to fit in well with the um, existing historic uh, pattern along uh, along Main Street. And um, uh, you know, I, I think uh, it 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 worked it worked so well that uh, as the town and uh, downtown redeveloped, you also had an interest. Uh, more pressure on the railroad district because you had this charming near, uh, neighborhood immediately adjacent to the downtown where uh, initially when I got here that there was interest in uh, property owners um, converting uh, their residential properties to bed and breakfasts or do a small office and, and that was um, one of another many controversies where uh, the idea was to uh, uh, recognize that those, the, the, those buildings, those residential buildings are in walking distance to the downtown. Uh, some people are going to enjoy the experience of a, of a bed and breakfast or someone doing a small office in the railroad district close to the downtown. But at some point, uh, when does a residential street 
become now you're sort of tilting it's sort of like a seesaw you're trying to create a balance between it's first and foremost a residential neighborhood when does it start tipping where at the end of the day more of the buildings are vacant because they're businesses the lights go out and when do you start tilting from a, a residential neighborhood to a semi um, you know commercial business areas and, and so uh, property owners in that area that have lived there a long time and really lived there because of the quality of the neighborhood sort of saying hey you know time out when's enough enough we need to get some control because we're worried that at some point um, people living in homes along some of the streets are going to be in the minority you know that the, the, the larger percentage of the properties are going to be converted to um, uh, bed and breakfast or offices and so we started uh, really taking a look at that and trying to um, structure our codes that uh, residential character and the elements that create a neighborhood in terms of long-term residences living there you know uh, 24 hours a day is the priority and that um, the other uses are sort of the are the visitors and and, and that's a it's a it's a difficult it's a difficult you know issue to tackle because uh, some uh, property owners really don't want the they want to maintain maximum flexibility of their use and and, and others um, are really wanting to keep it as a as a neighborhood and you lived in the railroad district when you first moved here i think um, what other changes have you seen in the district in in the time you've been here uh, Yeah, I did. I did. I, we moved here, and I, 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 we moved into a house at 130, 133 Fourth Street. That was our first house, and it was just a small 800 square foot home with two two bedrooms. And um, you know, that's, I just remember walking to work my first day, and just thought, okay, I think I this is heaven. There can't be a better you know, to get up in the morning and you, you have a five minute walk down 4th Street to, to Lithia Way or C Street at the time and then to Main Street to City Hall. Uh, you know, obviously a big, you know, I don't know if it's just the railroad district, but also just our historic districts in general. When I moved to the railroad district, you know, 4th Street was really a sleepy area you did not have that commercial area that now is just so viable with um, you know uh, peerless and, and the the other uh, uh, coffee shops and, and retail um, sales that are along there and then the redevelopment of a street was as tremendous as well uh, again I, th I think you had pressure uh, it, it was such a valuable area because of its proximity and walking distance to the downtown that w there became more and more pressure to uh, maximize development potential. If, if a property could have um, uh, a home or multiple homes that covered 75% of the site, but currently only covered 35 we generally would get proposals that covered 75 percent of the site we had um, like I said interest in terms of removing structures and um, the removal of structures that led to and I'm not sure if Ashland referred to it because sometimes I get it mixed up with my wife that grew up in Palo Alto that had something similar occur occurring the mansionization of neighborhoods where homes would be removed and something twice or three times the size would would come in and that led to the planning department um, working with neighbors and others to create um, a maximum building size uh, we created a formula and so as you redeveloped property uh, the buildings could only uh, be a certain size to to essentially uh, maintain uh, the character of the area I, 
I, I think it's, it's hard when you have a, a, a town like Ashland, it's hard to look at issues or neighborhoods in, in isolation. I think it's the compilation of those elements that create create the charm and so uh, while we are focused let's say on a historic district or a railroad district in, tor in, in terms of trying to deal with an issue I think it was also a recognition that uh, there's elements of a town that create the livability in our historic districts and the railroad districts were part of that and created sort of an attachment to the past and a biography of the past that really was um, is when you talk about Ashland it's one of the things that come up you know I, I, I've been in a lot of public involvement um, uh, uh, processes over the last 31 years and you would think that um, that the issues are constantly changing are new but you tend to see a thread in in Ashland culture and it tends to be a tremendous respect for the scenic qualities the backdrop in in, in the community a, a, a close attachment to the environment in terms of um, the natural environment and also being respectful in terms of managing you know whether it's our energy water air but also a recognition of um, the history and that um, what an asset it is to have our historic buildings and they ex uh, they reflect a, a scale and character that really defines us as a, as a community and, and I you know going back to the discussion about um, you know the whole big box ordinance and and Albertsons I I think I think that was a concern is that um, uh, uh, when people talk about we love our our small community um, or it's there's a community charm some people look at it that well I like the idea I know my neighbors but others look at it, it it's just sort of a physical scale uh, and that um, almost like there is a, uh, a a mindset that you have a good idea of just the general geography where the parameters and boundaries are of the town you could really um, you know it was wonderful our, our Lisa and our son Dylan is 25 but I remember growing up or him growing up in town and he went to Lincoln School and um, you know before he, he drove a car you could him and his buddies could walk from one side of the town uh, to the other and and that what a wonderful uh, thing that is in terms of to uh, really traverse your entire town probably on a summer day um, and you know go back out to uh, the east part of town and then wind up in the downtown by the end of the day and it's not that big of a trek so you know people um, really you know uh, define Ashland in, in terms of uh, 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 what planners define as a, a human a human scale that they can relate with and and as the changes became at a, at a magnitude that it made people uncomfortable often there was pressure on um, the community development department the council and the planning commission to look at how can we manage growth and, and direct it in a way that um, still allowed for change but without eroding the essential elements that define the community I think you were a big part in regional problem solving making that commitment after a 12-year regional process to try to um, accommodate a doubling of Ashwin's population in our existing boundaries. Um, so we've committed over the next 60 years not to expand our urban growth boundary any further. We're the only city in the valley that's done that. I'm just curious what you think that might lead to in terms of things. I know we've done the transit triangle, um, pedestrian places ordinance, trying to get some more development along arterials where the transit routes are, but I'm just curious if you've um, 
envision anything else coming with with the growth that we're expecting well you know ashland um i think one of the key challenges is that you 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 have uh, a, a group of citizens citizenry that's so passionate about the community and it's always been as i said i think maybe in my comments the size of the community is always sort of uh, a reoccurring theme because when, when people talk about small town i think they immediately are concerned about growth and continuing to grow out and often people like myself transplants from california grew up in communities just just kept moving out out and so uh, Ashland has uh, had a long uh, time policy of maintaining more of a, you know, uh, we re refer to it as a compact city form. And so uh, starting in the 90s, there was a, it started with a concern over annexing more property. Annexations, proposals to bring more property into the city limits were always uh, very controversial and um, because I think a, lo a lot of people saw it that's the first step to sort of losing uh, the, the qualities that we held dearest is that when you start moving away from this not only the city center but these other centers that we had and um, so as part of the regional uh, uh, problem solving and the and the regional planning process it it, it, it was um, very understandable that Ashland or it should have been no surprise that the the city of Ashland would not hop on the same bandwagon as a lot of other communities and look at the process and opportunity to show where we want to grow in the future but how can we accommodate future population growth um, uh, dealing with the local economy and housing within our current um, boundaries and uh, and so we took a position as a community that you know we're going to hold firm on our boundaries and we're going to try to figure out a way to accommodate uh, necessary housing and spur local economic development within um, uh, the current city limits and our current urban growth boundary it was seen as a responsible move in, in the way that it, you know you're you're using uh, existing city infrastructure you know your streets sewer water electric which are very e expensive to maintain so it's I think people don't realize when you take a position to try to infill and redevelopment and it's it's a very responsible uh, direction environmentally as well because these are expensive systems to maintain and each time you start extending them out it becomes uh, more of a burden uh, on the community so uh, all in all after that regional problem solving uh, we, we, we took a position to uh, keep our boundaries uh, uh, tight but uh, what we needed to do is look at ways to accommodate housing and the only way you can is looking at different styles that are generally more dense uh, they tend to go vertical rather than outward and uh, again um, those type of um, um, uh, examples that we started putting forth to the community as a way of accommodating growth uh, again led to anxiety because you're, you're 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 asking neighborhoods or the community to consider types of um, development styles that uh, were just not were just uncharacteristic of Ashland but you're sort of in a quandary you don't you don't want to grow out but you can't accommodate the requirements that the state of Oregon puts on communities to accommodate new housing with just allowing um, uh, the types of housing and development that occurred over the last hundred years it just wasn't at a density or coverage that would meet our needs and so 
what I think you try to do, uh, again, is, 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 and John Friganesi was, was great at, um, as well as John McLaughlin that I served under, is that you really focus on what people people like. So if, if you're going to build higher density development, you focus on things in terms of well, what are the key aspects of the site that we want to make sure we preserve? If there's, if there's uh, mature stately trees, let's make sure we incorporate those. Uh, can we create um, uh, design features that make um, uh, pedestrians and, and people in the area comfortable, find areas that they can, um, you know, sit down, gather, look at changes in design that even though the buildings could be taller, that there's a, d a lot going on in the design of the building to make, um, to make them, uh, to make the, those styles fit into the, into the neighborhoods. Uh, but, but I think, uh, you know, while we talk at a, a, a neighborhood scale often, uh, you know, one of the, 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 the larger controversies in town is that, um, I think I spoke to that, when I got here, there was a lot of locations in the hillsides around town that, um, I, I, as property values started to increase, you know, people would say, well, those aren't ever going to, we could always, those aren't, uh, while those are owned privately, they're never going to develop because it's just too costly to build. And with time, uh, uh, obviously with engineering they weren't as costly as you thought. We started seeing more development or more interest in terms of uh, building roadways and driveways into the hillsides and uh, and you started seeing the backdrop above the downtown starting to be sort of spreckled with homes and I don't I know everyone um, uh, has their own uh, probably opinion on home design but there's there's homes that can be designed well in a hillside there's homes that uh, can uh, be designed poorly and that tend to stick out more and more and there there were a few that were quite prominent and, and I think there's always key issues in town that sort of then lead to sort of a precipitous um, uh, dialogue among community members you know did you see that you know what's being done about that and and, and that was the case of some of the the hillside um, homes that we saw is that uh, the community and the council started hearing more what kind of controls do we have place are we gonna let this happen and so that sent us on a, a very uh, long process of Ashland again being the first community in the state of Oregon to d design um, to write hillside development standards and we used a lot of the examples in California because San Rafael and those areas and the Marin had been dealing with it and so we were able to look at some of their standards, go through a process, and um, place, uh, you know, uh, limitations on, on construction in the hillside, primarily in terms of how much of the hillside you can cut away, how can you make the home be more part of the hillside rather than stand out. You know, the idea was we need to allow for the homes because it's private property, but there are ways that they can be uh, integrated into the natural backdrop uh, and be part of the, of the landscape rather than being um, uh, you know something that that stands out. It was very controversial. The um, I know the state, the home builders, and the S state real estate association uh, appealed the ordinance to the state land use board of appeals. We ultimately were able to prevail. I don't think there was. I think there was a broader concern among some of those state organizations that Ashland was the first to do this. Are other cities going to follow suit? You know, and uh, we're concerned that other cities would start having stronger regulations for hillsides and things like that. But uh, again, I was—I think the community uh, never shied away from being <laughs> the first to do something. I, I think that was probably our, our biggest challenge as a community development department is that 
you have so many individuals that have great ideas, are very progressive, uh, are very, very bright, and are always um, giving the planning department as long of a rope as they want to go out and experiment with issues. But in the same part, we're just trying to also keep other things at bay and just manage uh, the day-to-day -day activities. But, you know, it's, it's tremendous to be a city planner be in a town like Ashland because generally, um, uh, I know city planners throughout the state, often their, their citizens are often saying, well, why would we ever want to look at that? You know, it, it, if it ain't broke, we don't need to fix it. You know, why, you guys, you know, just sort of, you just, just let's just process your permits where this community is always like looking at, well, why do we need to do the minimum in terms of how we protect streams or wetlands? Why can't we do more? And so it, it's tremendous to have a, you almost feel like you're never living up to the community's expectations to some degree mm -hmm. as a public servant. It's like, because the public interest is continuing to expand and, uh, but you know, it, it's def definitely never a dull moment. And we've been involved recently in a number of master plans, Croman, um, the normal neighborhood, and sometimes you'll hear from, from citizens and decision makers that that plan's been adopted and nothing's happened and that that's somehow a failure. I'm just curious with a little longer term perspective what you think about those master plans and how they are implemented more over time. Yeah. Um you know, master plans, um, we've had a lot of involvement with those, and I believe they've been really successful and, and well, and the, and the intentions were well. Um, the difficulty with master planning is that, I think in general, a lot of people have a hard time to understand what what planning is and what planners are doing. I, I think with the master planning is that we're trying to create, we see an area that has a lot of potentially development potential and a, a lot of opportunity for change. And the idea is you sort of want to be out in front of it rather than having to react to it because generally when you are reacting to it, uh, the adjacent neighborhood are, are as frustrated as that. Why didn't you do this earlier? Why, we're now we're having to deal with development. Why can't we be ahead of the curve? And since we know what's important to us as a community, put those in place. And so when change occurs, there's sort of a roadmap to direct it. And so that was the idea with our, our master plans is that, well, again, one thing that was great about Ashen we have a lot of great neighborhoods already that were developed over the last couple of hundred years. And we were able to take a lot of those um, elements, whether it was, you know, traditional gridded street patterns or even alley systems or walkways um, or, um, you know, uh, key open spaces that were integrated into um, existing neighborhoods and go into areas and say, and work with the neighbors and say, let's sort of put some of these on a plan. And so as we have interest in developing the area, the city can say, well, this is, this is the community's idea of how it should uh, take shape. And, and, and more often than not, uh, people that are developing property actually want that. I mean, when I have a discussion with uh, someone who wants to develop property, they often say, well, you know, what does the community want? And I know that sounds strange because I think we like to think that these are just all greedy developers, but um, they have an interest in certainty and they are generally concerned with being in contentious um, land use battles and they would like nothing more to be able to come into an area and do something that is consistent with community goals and that 
obviously they still have an interest in ha turning a profit because that's what they do they build houses or they build commercial buildings and so the master planning was a way to essentially uh, uh, define what's important to the community put it down display it graphically and it's I, I look at it as a road map to as development occurs and just uh, uh, this is what we're looking at and it, it but it provides flexibility too I, I think where the confusion comes is that the planning department in the city by and large are just providing guidance we don't determine when someone chooses to build are not to build that's uh, you know that's at the you know that's what a private property owner uh, decides to do so you had mentioned the Croman mill plan we put that in place because after the mill was abandoned in 1996 we knew that was our one really large area of commercial or employment property and we just wanted to be prepared so as we got interest in the area that we could make it clear in terms of what were the city's um, objectives in terms of street design um, protection of the wetlands in the area connections to other neighborhoods and have that on on paper but um, when it when it develops is really up to the private property owner and I think a lot of people have pointed you know fingers at the department saying well we adopted a plan and we've seen nothing um, and that's true I mean it, it, it and we've seen it v v incremental over time it, it ultimately will occur but uh, I think that the the city and the community having a plan is in in place really sets the objectives creates protections up front and provides the city with a great negotiating ability that as development occurs and changes to the plan that might have been fine 10 years ago that are not uh, well suited today we have an opportunity to be able to the neighbors the planning department and the developers negotiate uh, reasonable solutions and you've seen that I think with the North Mountain neighborhood plan too where that plan was adopted in the late 90s and really kind of came into its own just fairly recently after the last recession where um, developers were able to buy up some of those properties more cheaply and the market was really ripe to develop according to that plan. And you're now starting to see the neighborhood commercial core build out along Fair Oaks. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I think um, the North Mountain neighborhood uh, plan, uh, in my mind, and if you look at what Ashland was trying to achieve, is a success. And I go back to, um, when we talked about Ashland's part participation in the regional plan we took a position we're not going to grow out so we need to efficiently develop land within the city limits and the North Mountain plan was a recognition of that uh, I'm not going to say that there's probably many people out there maybe thousands of individuals that would have loved just to see it an empty field today but that really that wasn't a that wasn't a possibility the idea is that we recognize it was going to develop it was going to develop at a relatively um, high density of housing but we also um, recognized uh, the qualities of the area in terms of the Bear Creek floodplain an opportunity to create some neighborhood commercial when enough um, housing got built to create um, conveniences for those in, in the neighborhood so uh, uh, I, I think it's a, a success I mean that that, era, that sort of marks an interesting period of time in Ashland is that um, you know as I said when I got here in the late 80s and then it just seemed I, I envisioned it so I got here in the 80s and you we all like stepped on to this escalator that was moving at like a hundred miles an hour and that it just like you know every day it was something and it was very it was very exciting and there was always something new whether it was hillside or buildings getting demolished or someone building a shopping center or or public hearings that used to run till 2 30 a.m. in the morning until Mayor Gordon Madera said time out no one can is productive after 10 p.m. and so that led to um, the city council passing an ordinance that you know the planning commission can't go past 
10 p.m. because the hearing went till after 2 a.m. Um, and then you went out after. Yeah, and then yeah, yeah and then we were what, pr pretty useless the next day. But uh, but I'm not sure where I was with this. I started going <laughs> on track, see too many meetings, and <laughs> but um, no. What I think where I was going is that you get on this. <laughs> I get this, this fast moving escalator that all of a sudden the recession hits and it's like no one I think I don't think everyone ever imagines something because you know property values you know are just going up by double digits every year and you're in that pressure that it puts on the community is spawning a lot of our work in terms of how to protect this wonderful character while having pressure that everyone from the outside is going, God, have you been to Ashland? You got to go to Ashland. You got to get a house in Ashland. It's lovely play. I mean, it's, and so, but then there's a housing crash and it's the first time you're laying off employees, um, the construction industries in, in turmoil. Um, and it was just a way, it's sort of like a wake up call to everyone that, wow, you know, big things can happen. And uh, one of the, and I don't want to say one, of, I, I feel sort of bad saying one of the benefits of the crash because I know there was a lot of hardship for a lot of people, but it allowed, um, I think often, I think someone once told me, in, in periods, hard periods, often it allows you to become better than you were before. It, it was an opportunity, I know, I want to say for the city as a whole, as an organization, but I know for the Community Development Department to really take a look at ourselves because we needed, there was still the pressure from the community now to focus on bigger, broader long-range projects but we did not have the staff that we did because of cutbacks and it provided us an opportunity to reevaluate how we did things and I think in the end um, just came out much better because you can I think sometimes you can rest on your laurels that you just get in a way of doing things um, the same way and it's not that it was a bad way but when um, in time in hard times you really look at ways to be just as effective or more effective but with not the resources that you had so I think uh, I learned a lot um, uh, you know again I mean I'm not, I should say I mean the biggest asset of the department is um, uh, <laughs> you know the people that work there I mean it's a tremendous group of individuals that um, uh, really are interested in terms of listening and trying to make um, the community um, I think better all the time in, in a sense planners uh, are facilitators of public dialogue I mean while we while planners you know we're trained and we go to conferences and we learn the latest and greatest uh, someone once told me you know that really uh, planning is a reflection of the culture of the community it's really how Ashland approaches change and growth and development is going to be much different than another community and we we as essentially uh, public employees and planners have to be very respectful of that. We can't get ahead of that because often you can push too hard and if we don't have the support of the citizens we really can't do anything. I mean the, the accomplishments and I'm not saying they're my accomplishments, the accomplishments of the department over the 30 years um, really um, are reflect the community. I mean, um, I talk to planners all over the state and they are envious of the items that we've been able to do and pursue in Ashland and they always say, well, you, how, do you, how do you do that? Doesn't, don't you get pushed back from your council or your commission or citizen? I said, no, they're the ones that are, are driving it. I'd like to push back. I'd like to sort of stop them, <laughs> you know, slow them down. But um, so, um, 
you know, again, again, it's sort of a balance because uh, we want their support. And often, I, I guess you could go to some meetings and going, well, seeing some of the contentious dialogue and go, well, they don't really look like they're supporting you this evening. But I, I think that's just part of the process. When people get frustrated and they're upset, it's really just a, demonstrate, a demonstration of their of their passion for the community and I think the the basic community element are the neighborhoods and uh, individuals in those neighborhoods whether it's a commercial area like the downtown or the railroad district or Oak Knoll uh, I have never not witnessed that those individuals uh, feel an attachment to those areas and their neighbors and generally just want what's uh, best and um, you know so it's so exci exciting to work with a, a, a mm -hmm. group like that. So what do you see coming down the pipe in the future um, the next couple of years? Uh, you know I, I would say that I because we've been dealing with it a lot I, I, I almost want to say you know uh, you know, housing, 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 and diversity. And uh, that's where I see the biggest challenge to Ashland. And I probably already used the term, you know, cer certain ter like unintended consequences of our success or victims of our own success is when you, again, when you create the livability that we've created in Ashland and I see as a community that we've created I think I think everyone wants a piece of it and then compounded with the fact that we want to stay an intimate community is that um, there's only so much of us we're finite and so the value I just see the value is going to keep increasing and as I think value keeps increasing there's a move towards I think homogeneity in terms of um, the makeup of households because it's harder for families to be be here um, it's harder to afford to live here and I, I think that's just a really a foundation of Ashland I, I've seen is the diversity of the households and the diversity of the people and I think um, you know my background as a geographer as a planner you know I'm a, my graduate degrees in physical geography so I, 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 I to some degree I have an environmental background and when I study the environment we always talked about systems that diversity brings strength in any types of biological system and is when you start um, becoming sort of sort of mono uh, culture to some degree uh, there's problems and um, we're, we're not there I think we have a tremendous uh, uh, amount of diversity in the community but we can't I think we can't lose sight of that we always have to keep that front and center I, I don't think issues such as um, diversity of housing equity that when we um, when we look at new challenges our new planning efforts we need to be careful in terms of is there a displacement factor are we creating it is this project making it easier for people to live here be easier for us to main, maintain our ability to be a diverse if and it's not then I think we need to really question it because I think we're we're, we're it's something that we're, we're it's just going to be a part of our way of life that we're going to have to be careful if we want to really maintain um, what I think most of us really uh, enjoy about uh, the community is to be uh, uh, provide opportunities for a wide range of, of individuals to uh, have businesses and, and to live. Any final thoughts? Uh, I don't know. I don't probably don't have any final thoughts at this point. I mean, I'm sure I could come up with one. <laughs>
at, at some point in my time.